orbits. They are an interesting interaction between objects that are a result of several forces balancing. A lot of people just accept these without giving a second thought of how these actually work. I mean seriously, think about what is causing this object to move in this motion. Why are some orbits more elongated than others? And why are orbits in these round shapes anyway? Hello, I'm your host Freshy, and in this episode of the Space Age, we will be taking a look at the physics behind orbits. Before we properly get into the video, I would like to thank you all as I recently hit 100 subscribers. And to celebrate it, I made a video comparing the scale of our solar system, which is now actually the most popular video in my channel, link in the description. But anyways, let's get right back into the video. First of all, let's take a look at this scenario to explain why orbits are even possible. A planet's surface has an oversized red ball on it. If I were to let this play out, the ball would fall to the ground. Obvious physics is obvious. But what if I were to give it some sideways velocity? It still falls to the ground, but it traveled in an arc and took longer. Extrapolating this, Giving the ball increasing amounts of velocity results in this effect becoming more and more extreme. An orbit is when the arc of the ball has the same angle as the ground below it. It's constantly falling towards the planet, but it keeps missing due to its sideways velocity. The orbits we will be looking at consist of a smaller object orbiting around a larger object. The smaller object will be called a satellite, while the larger a main body. Looking at it in Newtonian terms, the satellite has sideways velocity. We call this tangential velocity, and we will represent this with a purple arrow. The main body brings its force of gravity represented in red on the satellite pulling it inwards and constantly turning the direction of tangential velocity. This causes the expected direction represented in green to form a curve and keep the satellite at a stable distance. So an orbit is essentially a balance between both gravity and tangential velocity, but it does not have to be a perfect balance. And this is where shape and eccentricity of orbits come into play. Let's stitch the ball and instead throw smaller round bodies at the main body while we get a bird's eye view. We already know that if I were to give the satellite a minimal amount of velocity, gravity would overpower it and it would fall into the main body as it can't maintain a flat enough arc. If I were to give it a bit more velocity, then it might be able to orbit the planet a few times before spiraling in to its destruction. The physics behind this are similar to a circular orbit, but gravity is slightly too strong, resulting in the satellite getting turned inwards too much. After this death spiral, orbits, depending on their ratio between gravity and tangential velocity, will form a conic shape. Conic shapes are derived from intersecting a cone at various angles. For example, cutting the cone straight in a perpendicular fashion will give you a circle, the shape that we get if we have a perfect balance between gravity and tangential velocity. The more drastic the angle that you cut the cone, the stronger the tangential velocity. This is a neat way of remembering what adding or subtracting gravity or tangential velocity does to an orbit. 
circular orbits are pretty basic. As mentioned before, they have a perfect balance between tangential velocity and gravity. But let's take a look at the geometry of this type of orbit. At the center of a circle, we have something called a focus, which we will be representing using an F. This is a special point defined so that every point on the circle is at an equal distance away from it. And the distance between the points and the focus is called the radius, while the entire length of the circle through the focus is called the diameter, which will be double the length of the radius. The focus is also where the main body roughly lies, while the satellite roughly travels around the circumference. I say roughly because both objects actually orbit around their combined center of mass called a barycenter, but this isn't that important unless both objects are somewhat similar in size. And if they are both the same size, they actually do this cool thing where they seemingly orbit nothing. Going back to the cone, cutting it at a slight angle will result in an ellipse. These types of orbits are going to be the main focus of this video. First of all, let's take a look at how this type of orbit works. We will send the satellite in with a bit more velocity than what's needed for a circular orbit. As the satellite approaches the main body, both its velocity and the force of gravity are facing the same general direction, causing them to stack and moving the object very fast towards the main body, only adding on to the speed as gravity gets stronger. And then, the satellite passes the main body, causing that extremely strong gravity to swing backwards and rapidly turn the satellite. After that, then the now redirected, strong tangential velocity points outwards, causing the satellite to be hurled into space. This momentum will then get slowly depleted as the satellite uses its velocity to try and escape the orbit before gravity turns it back in again and repeats the cycle. Now, let's take a look at the geometry of the elliptical orbit. Contrary to the circle, there are two foci, and we will also use F to represent these and separate the two with subscript, creating F1 and F2. Let's now take a random point on the ellipse's circumference, we'll call it point P. So, there will be a distance between point P and each of the foci. Let's call these distances D1 and D2, respectively. An ellipse is defined in such a way so that for every point on its circumference, D1 plus D2 will be the same. For example, D1 and D2 could be 5 AU long for one point on an ellipse, but for another point on that same ellipse, D1 could be 8 AU long, while D2 could be 2 AU long. As long as they add up to the same value, the shape will be an ellipse. Draw a line that starts at one end of the ellipse, goes through both foci, and stops at the other end of the ellipse, and you've got yourself the major axis, or longest diameter, of an ellipse. Perpendicular to this, you have the minor axis, which you guessed it, is the smallest diameter of an ellipse. You can also cut these in half to get semi-variance of the axes. As you would expect, the satellite goes around the circumference of the ellipse, but the main body is a bit more tricky, as it's found in only one of the foci, making it off-center. Johannes Kepler actually made a law to describe the main body's placement called Kepler's first law, which is one of his three laws that are supposed to define the properties of an elliptical orbit. 
If you show the major axis of the orbit, you notice that it intersects the circumference twice, creating two points. The one closest to the main body is the periapsis, and the farthest is the apoapsis. These are the farthest and closest points the satellite can be to its main body, respectively. In some orbits, like the Earth's, the apoapsis and periapsis can be nearly the same, hinting at an almost circular orbit. However, some comets can have some ridiculously large differences between the two, hinting at a very elliptical and elongated orbit. There is actually a property that measures how elliptical an orbit is called eccentricity. An eccentricity value of zero represents a perfect circle, while an eccentricity value of repeating 0.9s represents an infinitely long ellipse. You know how I said that the main body has to be on one of the foci? Well, how far away the second foci is determines the eccentricity of an orbit. Specifically, eccentricity's value can be found out by taking the distance between the two foci and dividing it by the major axis. Eccentricity also causes the satellite's velocity to change across its orbit. So unlike in a circular orbit, where the satellite is going at a constant speed, satellites of elliptical orbits speed up and slow down, even if it takes the same amount of time to complete one orbit. Remember that guy Kepler? He even made a law, his second law, about this that can be applied to all orbits, which goes something like this. Take the satellite and main body. Now let's create a line between them. Now take any amount of time. For our example, let's use one second. Now what we are going to do is take note of the line we drew and then play the orbit simulation for that amount of time and then pause it again, taking note of the second line. And after the one second, we now create a shape using the two lines and the orbital circumference. This shape has an area, and the thing about Kepler's second law is that you can repeat this process in different parts of an object's orbit, and the shape created will always have the same area. A highly eccentric orbit indicates that tangential velocity is significantly greater than gravity, while an orbit with little to no eccentricity indicates that gravity and tangential velocity are almost or are equal. The reason why more tangential velocity results in a more eccentric orbit is something like this. Remember when I walked through elliptical orbits? Well, let's take another look at this part, the now redirected strong tangential velocity points outwards, causing the satellite to be hurled into space. This momentum will then get slowly depleted as the satellite uses its velocity to try and escape the orbit before gravity turns it back in again and repeats the cycle. So therefore, the more tangential velocity the satellite has, the longer it can sustain its outwards trajectory before being pulled back in. Well, there are also scenarios where the satellite actually has enough tangential velocity to never be pulled back in, but considering the length of this video already, I think I'll make a part 2 talking about those types of orbits. Well, really, non-orbits, because they can't actually sustain a... You know what? Just watch part 2. Sorry that this video took so long to make. School has been ramping up recently, but hey, all the more reason to subscribe so you don't miss my next upload due to YouTube forgetting that you watched this video like 3 months ago. BAM! Turn not uploading into a positive just like that. See ya.